to uh, treading through Timothy, back to 1 Timothy, back to chapter 1, picking up exactly where we left off just a couple of weeks ago, 1 Timothy chapter chapter 1. And uh, we're not racing through this. We're not sprinting through this. To be fair, those of you who've been around a good few years will know that I've never raced, sprinted through a book of the Bible in my life. And uh, I don't know how long it will take us. I don't set out a plan. I just go as the Lord leads. Um, but I pray that God will help us as we go and take this journey through the pastoral epistles. Maybe all, maybe just this one. The Lord hasn't convicted me yet of where we go, but I know we're in First Timothy. And, of course, this is um, a letter of ministry to the local churches and about the local church, but it is also a letter of ministry and authority to pastors, but also a letter of ministry and authority to every one of us who sit in the pew in the local church. So it has great and wide meaning. It has some very specific points that we'll look at as we go through. We've looked at the uh, Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, his son in the faith, of course. A series of charges contained uh, 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 instructions, uh, commands and lifts to Timothy, and then by extension to us through the preservation of God's word. And last time around, we looked at this, uh, this uh, uh, um, or last couple of times, there's the way the law had crept in, false preachers preaching a false gospel, that the law had to be observed to be saved. And uh, Paul was very much in the, ch this was in the church at Ephesus, remember, specifically at the time of writing, but to all local churches today, um, this, this need to, to prevent any false gospel being spread. And the Apostle Paul said that we are an angel from heaven to preach any other gospel. Let them be accursed, because it's the difference between heaven and hell. And any version of a false gospel that preaches anything other than salvation by grace, through faith, by belief alone in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is a false gospel, a hideous gospel. And, uh, and that's how important it is because it is the difference between heaven and hell. And Paul said, you know, the law is great. If it's used lawfully, that's right. It's the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It's to show us that we are sinners. That's what the law is to be used for. And he gave his thanks to Christ Jesus, who came to him faithful, and he, and he gave his own testimony and his own recognition of his disgraceful state before God as a, a blasphemer, one who'd been injurious to the church. He'd been consenting and involved and conspired with the, the murder of the, the first Christian martyr, Stephen the Apostle, but he'd also been involved in the imprisonment and punishment of Christians wreaking, wreaking havoc and slaughter on the churches. And we finished up with that wonderful truth of verse 14, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So today we pick up continuing from there on, on verses 15 and 16. We may get to 16, we may not. I'll see how the time treats us this morning. But as we read these two verses together, verses 15 and 16 this morning, really verse number 15, everybody's always aware of John 3, 16, aren't they? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Even people in the world are aware of John 3, 16. It's the most famous verse of the Bible, most well-known verse of the Bible in the world. But to be fair, this verse number 15 is the Pauline equivalent you know, of what John wrote in John chapter 3, because this is just an incredible, incredible verse. So let's read verse 15 and 16. Uh, if you would follow along with me as I read from the Word of God this morning, which says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. And we'll end our reading there this morning. And we cannot overstate the importance of this great truth contained in verse number 15. Wherever this great truth is changed, misapplied, or misaligned, it is the difference between heaven and hell. We come to it with the thought this morning, it could have been the purpose of Christ's coming, but I also uh, picked up there, just on this unworthy of all acceptation, and the title of this morning's message is, The Expectation is Acceptation. The Expectation is Acceptation. Let's take a minute and pray, and ask the Lord to help us this morning, 
as we deal with this most important truth of all history and eternity. Our Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before your holy and heavenly word this morning. Our Lord, we, we bow in the knowledge of this great truth of our great Savior who came to save all sinners, the Savior of the world. Of course, many will reject, revile, and ridicule. But nonetheless, we see the purpose of Jesus Christ coming, leaving his home in heaven and coming to earth. Our Heavenly Father, may we go forth with great authority, great rejoicing in this truth. May we be continually reminded, Lord, we come off the back of a missions-minded weekend. And it doesn't matter whether we're in Tiverton or Timbuktu, this is the truth for the world that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, came to save sinners. Our Heavenly Father, that's a truth that never goes grows old or cold. It's a truth never to be interpreted, realigned for the ages in which we live. Sin is the curse. Christ is the cure. Help us, our God, to be refreshed and reminded of this great simplicity, of this great truth that echoes to all eternity. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You see, this is a wonderful truth, isn't it? Because we know so much about uh, uh, where, where Jesus came from, if we will. We know where he was born there in Nazareth. We know when and we know how this came about through the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost. But this verse, quite simply and singularly, tells us why Jesus came. Why did Jesus Christ leave that home in glory? Why did Jesus Christ humble himself as the word of all eternity, as John 1 tells us, as the creator of heaven and earth, as Colossians 1 tells us, as John 1 also reminds us, why did he humble himself? Why did he step down? Why did he take those seven steps of humiliation contained in Philippians chapter 2? Why did he come and live among sinful men? Why was he born as a babe in a manger? Why did he live a sinless and perfect life? Why did he surrender? Why did he lay down his life? Why did he go to the cross? None of it was by accident. All of it was by design. This is the purpose for the Lord Jesus Christ coming. This verse, number 15, encapsulates the most glorious truth of the entire Bible. There are many truths contained in the Bible, but this is the preeminent and the priority truth, and this is the specific reason why the Lord Jesus Christ came. This is of particular importance because it relates to the primary purpose. You see, because it would be easy to think in this day and age we could listen to some who proclaim of Christ and say, Jesus Christ came so that I could have a, a better life. Well, there's a truth in that, but it's not the truth and it's not the reason why he came. The truth of it is your life could get a lot worse after you're saved than before you were saved. But Jesus came so I could have a better marriage. Well, not necessarily so. If only one of you gets saved, your marriage could get a whole lot worse. You say, well, you know, both of us are saved and it's no good. Well, that, that, that's because one of you is not living right. That's that simple enough. If you're both saved, Jesus is going to give you a better marriage. So, you know, Jesus, Jesus came so I can have a better job and a more fruitful life. Now, those things are very often true. After you get saved, life changes in a dramatic way. We become better stewards. We see things differently. We have the truth of the word of God. And many areas of our life will improve. But that's not why Jesus came. Those are all byproducts of salvation and having the word of God, the word of truth before us. The Lord Jesus Christ came simply into this world to save sinners. That's it. That's it. Anything else is a bonus and a byproduct, but not why Christ came. One message, one mission, to save sinners. And firstly, we see as we look at verse number 15, we see there's an exclamation. This is a faithful saying, Paul writes, under the inspiration of God, as we read today under the preservation of God in his perfect word. This is a faithful saying. I, it's true. It's trustworthy. It's certain. 
It's sure. This is a certain saying, a faithful saying, a sure saying, a set saying, a saying that actually indicates a doctrine believed and accepted by the whole of the church, the New Testament church, for all ages. This is what he's saying. You know, it'd be easy to read this and say, you know, Paul is saying this is a faithful saying. There he's putting emphasis on that. Well, does this mean in the rest of Paul's 13 epistles that he's got some sayings that aren't faithful and aren't certain and aren't sure? Or, or the rest of the Bible, the other, you know, all the 66 books of the Bible, there's, there's some things that are faithful and some things that are not. Of course not. That's not what he's saying. The whole of the Bible is true completely, and it is truth completely. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. We know that. But what Paul is saying here under the inspiration of God is here is a truth of some primary importance. You see, the Bible contains all truths, and all truth is important, but some truths are more important than others. Some truths in the Bible tell us how to live as a wife, how to live as a husband, how to live as a father, how to live as a mother. Is that important? Yes. But more important than that, most important is that we know why Jesus Christ came, not to make us a better husband, wife, mother, father, son, or daughter, to save sinners. This is the primary truth, the primary purpose, the reason for the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul says this is a faithful, certain, sure, saying, doctrine, truth, a repetition of that which Christ said, repetition of the great truth before. It is certain. It is sure. You know, you could have a faithful copy of something, couldn't you, that's true to the original. And in a sense, Paul is saying, this is a faithful saying because it's exactly what Jesus Christ said would happen. It just follows on the baton is passed one to another. You see, a faithful saying is a wonderful word. Interestingly enough, this phrase, faithful saying, is used only four times in the entire Bible, and it's used only in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. We won't look at the other ones today. We'll deal with it when they come. But that's interesting, isn't it? Because we're told here in 1 Timothy that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The New Testament local church is the pillar and ground, the repository of God's truth for the entirety of the church age. That's where he has put his truth into the local church. And with that, we get this expression through the pastoral epistles that this is a faithful, most important, enduring, set, certain, and true truth. And we see this is why it is the first one that's introduced in the faithful saints, because it takes the primacy and the preeminence that Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners. And I think that's important because, you know, we find in the Bible that God is faithful. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, faithfulness is so important. Uh, the book to the Ephesians, Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 1 and verse 1 is written to the faithful in Christ Jesus. You understand you have some people who are not faithful in Christ Jesus? You can be saved and unfaithful. Uh, you've seen it. Maybe you are one of those people. Faithfulness is important. Uh, to faithful ministers, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 21. Some ministers, pastors, are not faithful. Faithful ministers. And faithful brethren, Colossians 1, 2. Faithfulness is important to God. Truth, certainty, and surety is, is important to God. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There's a great truth, isn't it? And I think this is important that the Lord has preserved this great saying. This is a faithful, true, certain, and sure saying because we live in days of unfaithfulness. We live in days of such uncertainty. In fact, we live in days where even where things we thought were certain are not certain anymore. You know, we live in days where people aren't even certain whether there's a man or woman on the face of the planet. So, you know, and people are confused about such things about that. We live in unfaithful, confusing times. And therefore, we have the bedrock of God's truth before us. We have God's perfect words before us containing perfect truths that contain the primacy and the primary reason for Jesus Christ to come. And that simply is this to save sinners. And this exclamation, Paul said, I'm speaking it, but you know, we can say a saying or we can read a saying. See, we're reading it here, aren't we? We're not physically listening to the Apostle Paul. 
We're not physically listening to Timothy. We're reading a saying. Now, there are many sayings in the world, you know, old sayings and, you know, all these things that, you know, uh, bits of bits of wisdom that are old and faithful sayings to some degree, you know, and they're classic out, clout till May is out and all these old things. Uh, and they've got some wisdom. You know, when you see the cows lying down, it's going to rain and all this stuff. They're old sayings that have come down through the ages. Well, they're not faithful because they're not completely true. So just because something is old, just because something is passed down, something is inherited by tradition and repetition doesn't necessarily make it true and truth. But we are told that this exclamation that is given to exclaim, to put something forward of this absolute truth that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners is a faithful saying and that in days of unfaithfulness, even days of unfaithfulness in the church of Jesus Christ the Lord, where people uh, will put forth smooth words of prophecy to tickle itching ears. You know, believe on Jesus and your life will get better. Believe on Jesus and you'll have more money. You know, they, they give a reason, a hook and a bait. This is why you should believe in Jesus. But they're all completely unbiblical. They're all not necessarily true. And there is no guarantee to each person other than this. Believe in Jesus because you are a sinner. And Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. By saying that, we are repeating a faithful saying. We're on solid ground. And that's where we need to be in days of unfaithfulness and untruth. In fact, the very notion of truth has been cast as subjective and changeable. The very notion that there can be unchangeable truths has been tried and has been tested. And some truths are falling and failing, but that's because they're not God's truths. God's truth is timeless, eternally true. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go into the world on the doorstep or the street, when I go into the workplace, the school or the college, when I speak with my neighbors or my relatives, I want to be on solid ground when I tell them something that this is absolutely true. Because in any area of life, I can make a mistake the same as you or I can. But by taking this verse of the Bible... I can say with absolute authority, as I combine Scripture with Scripture, no matter who that I speak to, no matter where I speak to someone, no matter what age, what gender, or what country I speak to them in, it didn't matter to Peter a couple of weeks ago when he was in the Netherlands. It didn't matter to Sam when he lived in America. It didn't matter to any of us when we travel around on our holidays. Whatever country we were in, we can say to anyone who's not already a Christian that you are a sinner. Because the Bible declares it as none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. For the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6.23. Those are truths that we can declare and stand on solid ground. And I want to be on solid ground if I'm going to declare those things to people. Do you know why? They're not easy things to hear, are they? Sometimes I think we get so used to saying those things, we forget what that, an affront that can be to people's hearing who's unsaved, isn't it? We get so used to it, it rolls off the tongue. I, I thank God we're in a church where you can actually use the word sinner, not wrongdoer. You know, even the word sin has been taken out of so many churches. Now they write uh, things they call Bibles with those words taken out. You know, before long, we'll have a, you know, a Bible that addresses uh, people with a predilection for alcohol and those who like to visit sexual workers, drunkards and fornicators and whoremongers, God's word says. And we're in a church where we can say those things because that's how God meant them to be, to stab the heart to bring conviction of sin. Now, if I'm going to go out onto the highways and the byways and the highways and the hedges and speak those truths, you know what I want to be? I want to be certain that if I'm going to cause any upset or any offense to somebody, that I'm speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. I don't want to be in any doubt whatsoever that what I'm saying that may cause offense is in any way potentially untrue or uncertain. That's why I thank God that I have the perfect words of God here on the pulpit before me. 
I don't know, just something that God may have said some parts of it and not others, and some may be mistakes and some may not. Uh, and I'm not going to go down the, the, the Bible route today, but I know this. If you've got a Bible where in the margins or the footnotes it even questions itself and says some manuscripts have this and some manuscripts say that, then you ought to throw that thing on the fire and get rid of it. Because if you're going to go out to somebody in the street and tell them they're a sinner and open that book, they'll point to your page and say, well, even your book says it's got some mistakes in it. So how do you know that this is a faithful saying? And that's why I want the perfect word of God with the perfect truth, because I'm taking perfect truth to imperfect people. And many people may get offended by what was saying, but I can speak the truth in love, knowing what it was like to remember what it was like to be offended by the truth of God's word. So therefore, we can faithfully exclaim we can make that faithful saying as we are called to do with confidence. It doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter what setting we are in. It doesn't matter what nation or gender and nationality we are speaking to. We can make an exclamation just as the Apostle Paul did and Christians down through the ages with 100% certainty that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like you. Because he saved a sinner like me. And because his word says so. That's why he came. You see, many people will engage with you. I'm sure you've experienced this, you know, over the years, probably as you've been a Christian. Many people will talk about the wonderful things Jesus did. Oh, he was a great healer. Perhaps he was an early physician. Perhaps he was an astronaut, a spaceman, an alien. I mean, you've heard all of this stuff, right? You know, a time traveler. I mean, you've heard all this nonsense out there. But then you've got those who say, well, he was a social reformer. He was a great social reformer. He included women in the days of patriarchy. He was a, he was a trendsetter. You know, he was a, he was a good man. That's where he came to try and just shake the dust off the world a little bit. And all of those things may or may not, well, the fact he was an astronaut, well, a time traveler, I guess that would be true. He's outside of time, he came from heaven. But they're not the reason why he came, are they? So we have to know exactly why he came, what was his purpose, what was God's plan, what was the priority, because his priority must be our priority, his purpose must be our purpose, his truth must be our truth, and on solid ground we stand. And we can exclaim as Christians down through the ages that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You see, but the exclamation was made with an expectation. Look again with me at verse number 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. You see, there is an expectation that is placed there. There's an expectation in the word of God. There's an expectation from the apostle Paul. There's an expectation from God that there is such value in what Christ has brought, there is such value in the truth of God that it is worthy of all acceptation. Worthy means worth something. It is worth it. It is valuable. Uh, and the Bible tells us, God himself tells us, that it is of the greatest worth that we understand the truth of why Christ Jesus came. There is nothing more valuable in this world now, I was speaking to somebody who was just recently talking about the price of gold. I won't give the name away. I don't want you to point up the floorboards and things, okay? Now, you would think, and I would think honestly, that if we just took one of the bars of gold from under our floorboard, that we could walk down the high street, find a, you know, a homeless person in the doorway and say, here's a bar of gold just for you. Is that valuable? Well, you could say it depends on the size of the bar of gold, but gold is valuable, right? Here's this. Take it away. I've got something of worth for you. Now, do you think the homeless person is going to go, oh, that's, that's not really worth my effort sticking out my hand. I, you know, it's, it's shiny, it's valuable, but you know, I'm just quite happy here in my sleeping bag, you know, my dodgy wrappers and, and all the rest. The worth of the value of the bar of gold would be received instantly and would be received immediately because of the value that it has to change something. But dear Christian, we'd be selling ourselves short. We'd be selling this world short. If we didn't take the message into the world that we have the greatest gift and truth that we can give to any individual, 
What did Peter and John? Silver and gold have I none. Because that wasn't the greatest gift that they could give to that man that day. The greatest gift of most value, worthy, worth all acceptation, is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christian, do we know that we have the most valuable gift to give? It has been entrusted unto us as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, as ministers of reconciliation between man and God, to take the most valuable thing that has been given to us, the gift of our salvation, to take that out, to stretch out our hand from bum to boardroom, and say, no matter how much you earn or how little you have, I have the gift of the greatest value that this world can ever have. No matter how many houses you own or don't, cars you own or don't, boats you own or don't, guilt trust you own or don't, I have the gift and the message of the greatest value because it spans life, death, time, and eternity. And I can faithfully declare unto you with an expectation that you will accept this, the greatest gift. God expects this truth to be accepted by all. Worthy of all ac acceptation, worth something. God is saying this is deserving of the right decision. That's how valuable it is. He expects that every person in every nation will receive the gift of salvation because it is the right decision. Worthy of all acceptation, not worthy of all rejection. Rejection of the gospel is a foolish, foolish notion. Worthy of all acceptation. That's another quite simple part of the scriptures, all means all. Christ died for all. Not some, all. And the Bible says that all need it, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, not some. All can receive it. There are no restrictions. There are no objections. There are not just some that Christ died for. Not some group of people, not some particular group of sinners, not some particular, uh, uh, those in favor or particular uh, uh, um, expectation of receipt of the gospel. Christ died for all, and God expects all to find that such a worthy, faithful saying that all are required to accept it. It's quite simple. It's quite simple. It can be embraced by all. It can be believed by all. Now, I understand that not every Christian thinks that. I understand all has been changed to some. Okay, but I, I just believe what the Bible says. And that's simple enough. Christ died for all. All are sinners. All can be saved. And in my English Bible, all means all, where it means all, unless otherwise stated. In the matter of salvation, there is no otherwise stated. Christ died for all. Even when we get down into Romans 1, where we read some people who God gives over uh, 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 to a reprobate mind. Before that, he gives them up to their vile affections, but he doesn't write them off with the reprobate mind. The expectation is still they will receive the gospel. It's not until they did not like to retain God in their knowledge that he gives them over to the reprobate mind. You see, nobody is restricted from salvation. Many will not receive it, and many will reject it, and some will place themselves in a position of having a reprobate mind, whereby then, for whatever season God gives them that reprobate mind, whether it be temporary or permanent, and the Bible doesn't say, they will not be able to receive the gospel. But until they receive that point of not liking to retain God in their knowledge, Christ died for all, even when it doesn't suit us. It's a simple biblical truth. So we can make the exclamation of the gospel with an expectation that it will be received. Isn't that wonderful freeing news? Because I, I, I know some Christians, and maybe I, it's hard for me to remember back to when I was first saved, how I approached some things. Maybe it is for you too. Um, and I think the, the excitement of salvation 
when we were saved, never for a minute made us apologetic or nervous. It didn't mean, you know, I, I knew people needed what I got. And, and all that ne it was needed was they needed to understand it the same way as I had understood it. And because I hadn't understood it before, it just meant they hadn't understood it. And if I explained it properly, they'd be as excited as I was, right? So you don't go forward with any lack of confidence when you first say, you just realize it just needs you to explain it properly because clearly other people hadn't explained it properly to you over the years, which is why you never got saved until you did get saved because at that point somebody explained it properly to you. We leave out the fact that the Lord convicted us of our sin, reproving and rebuking the world of sin, the work of the Holy Spirit of God drawing and leading. And we just needed somebody to explain it better, and now I'll explain it better to other people, and I'll explain it so well that everyone I explain it to will get saved. And of course, that would be a foolish notion as well, that the Bible shows otherwise. But nonetheless, the Bible says we can make that exclamation with the expectation that that faithful saying is worthy of all acceptation. And God expects them to accept it, not to reject it. And that's the confidence we have when we go out with the gospel, because you know what the Lord did for you. And you go out with that confidence of the word of God, the will of God, and the way of God. You go out with 100% confidence. Do not apologize for bringing someone the gospel. Truly, it's a sad thing when people reject the gospel. Now, we don't know if they'll continue to reject it. You might just be a link in the chain, that first sledgehammer that breaks down the hardness of the heart. Then somebody else comes along and chink. Somebody else comes along and chink. The word of God goes forth, is my word, not like a, like a fire, like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. The hardness of our heart may be broken down over repeated times and seasons because life is a changing pattern, isn't it? <laughs> And there may be times in your life and other people's life that make you more receptive to the gospel than others. But nonetheless, we cannot determine what they are. So God's expectation is that we go out and exclaim the faithful saying and we have an expectation that those to whom we've given the gospel get saved. We go out with confidence. We don't go out as uh, uh, in, in a shriveling, apologetic, oh, please forgive me. I've got this little thing that you might be interested in. Might not. I, I don't really know. You know, you kind of go out like you are a heap, ever so humble, ever so humble. Now there's a humility that's stupidity and false. We go out with a holy boldness. That's not arrogance. You've heard me say this before. It's confidence, not in us, but in our God. Not in our words, but God's words. Confident that God has sent you and me out. Yes, you sat in your chair. God is sending you out with the message of the gospel. Not just professional evangelists, not just those who feel called, not just those who are very experienced in knocking on the doors or standing on the streets. You sat in your chair. If you are saved by the grace of God and Christ is your savior, he said, go ye, that's you, therefore, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Exclaim it with a holy confidence, exclaim it with a holy boldness, and exclaim it with an expectation that it is worthy of all acceptance. You're not taking a second-rate message. You're not taking the second-rate offer. You're offering people the greatest gift, the most valuable gift that could ever be received. That will be of value through time and eternity. A new hope, a new life, a new start. A new eternity, new life in Christ. Can there be anything any better? Friends, do not go out there apologetically with the gospel. Now, you may adapt the approach to the person if you know them, but nonetheless, please don't be apologetic. Do not apologize for offering the greatest message of the greatest truth of the greatest gift that you could give to anyone. Hold that thought in your mind. That you say, well, I have no problem whatsoever if I had a spare bit of a thousand pounds in my pocket, a gold bar, and just held out my hand and said, would you like this? I, I've just got the spare. I, you can have this. You have no reservation in going forth with that. Well, my friend, the gospel, the gospel, the gift of salvation, makes whatever you could think of to give away pale into insignificance. Treat it accordingly. You are offering someone, no matter their status and standing in life, the most valuable gift they will ever be offered. We see the exclamation. We see the expectation. 
And then thirdly, we see the exoneration. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am, not the present tense there, chief. Isn't that incredible? Now, I've used exoneration for my alliteration here this morning, but the, the truth of the meaning of the word is it's not strictly true because exoneration occurs when a, a conviction for a crime has been removed. When a person is absolved of guilt, they are exonerated. That's the legal meaning of it. And to be fair, we're not exonerated in that term because our guilt stands. We are sinners and always will be sinners before a just and holy God. And the only righteousness that we have is not because we are no longer guilty of being sinners. God got the information wrong. The righteousness we have is not that we have been uh, 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 let off because of different information and we're not guilty. The righteousness we have is because we're guilty and our exoneration comes from the fact our punishment, our price has been paid in Christ. We are absolved and unconvicted not because of our lack of guilt. We are and continue to be guilty sinners before a holy God. But it's in his goodness, in his forgiveness, in his righteousness that we stand. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Therefore, in Christ, Paul says, we are as sinners exonerated by that belief in his death and his burial and his resurrection. You see, it's all contained by the statement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We see the person of Christ. Notice this is a particular reference again that Paul uses Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ. See, Christ the anointed one is exactly the same as the Old Testament version of Messiah, the anointed one, the king, the one who is anointed for this position. Christ is the anointed son of God, God the son. Jesus simply means God who saves. The anointed one, God who saves. That's what Christ Jesus means. You see, the person of Christ is holy and without blame. The person of Christ is not just the son of God. He is God the son. The personhood, the deity of Jesus Christ. He is not a created being. He is not the super angel as the Jehovah's Witnesses might have you to believe. He is not the brother of Lucifer as the uh, the more... Mormons would have you to believe. I nearly reverted to my usual uh, uh, nomenclature for them, but I think I'll be respectful this morning. He is God the Son. He is not a created being. He is the creator. Christ Jesus, God the Son, God the Savior. You see, and that's why the exoneration comes, because the perfect Holy and righteous one is the one who came down, is the one who took our place, is the substitute for us. We see the person of Christ, but we see the position of Christ. Christ Jesus came into the world. Now, that's important because it doesn't say Christ Jesus came into being, came into creation. Christ Jesus came into the world. It doesn't say he came into existence. You see, you, 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 can, you, you can accept this truth because we know that in the beginning was the Word, John 1, 1. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We took some time to examine that in our Easter services. I won't labor this today. But, you know, the old Catholics, they say, Holy Mary, Mother of God. And that is a terrific Terrific heresy. She's not the mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus. He already was God. And you see just how those simple things can lead to craziness and people thinking that Christ was created or he became, he became the Christ at his baptism when he was anointed. There's all these things that people misunderstand. But he is the word of eternity. The word from eternity past, 
the Savior of eternity future, who stepped out of eternity into time, and he came into this world, not into beginning, not into being. He stepped down from his home in heaven. That's the position of Christ, the person of Christ. But we see the purpose of Christ. He came into the world to save sinners. That's it. That's it. The only thing that you can claim as an absolute truth when you speak to somebody else in this world, hold back from saying, uh, hold back from saying, you know, you'll end up with more money. You'll end up with a better job. You'll end up with a better marriage. You'll end up with a better life. Those things may, may be true. Equally so, you may lose your head and be imprisoned or killed, depending on what country you become a Christian in, might you? Now, your eternity is going to be a lot better, but your life may get a bit worse. The purpose of Christ, to save sinners. On that we stand with confidence and assurance and truth. Why did Jesus Christ come? To save sinners like you. What was the purpose? To save sinners like you. What's the point? To save sinners like you. A lot of people want to sidetrack. What about the dirt? What about the age of the earth? What about the dust on the moon? What about this? What about that? Let's put all that to one side because Christ is the creator, but he came into this world. Historians verify it. The Bible proves it. The witnesses affirm it. He came into this world not to justify the age of the earth, not to tell you all about the dinosaurs, not to explain why the moon is the distance it is from the earth and the sun and all those things are wonderful truths of creation. But let's get back right on track because I'm on the street with you. I'm on the doorstep with you. And this is why Jesus Christ has sent me out to speak to you, to tell you he came into the world to save sinners like you. Uh, do you believe you've ever sinned? Just get it back on that. Because no one can ever deny that. Oh, they can argue it. But no one can honestly convince themselves that they are not a sinner. They have to explain the word. They may have a little trouble with the word. But friends, that's the purpose of Christ. To save sinners. Do you know, do you know uh, some, some may even get that wrong. So he came into the world to condemn you, to judge you. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He didn't come in the world, into the world. At his first advent, at his first coming, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. And he didn't come in the world to judge the world. In fact, the Bible is very clear on it. Go to uh, John 3. John 3. John chapter 3. He came into this world to save sinners. That's why he came. Let's not get confused with why he's coming again. Why did he come first time? John chapter 3, verse number 16. He came for this reason, for God so loved the world. He came because of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He came because of God's love. And God goes the extra mile to tell us that Jesus Christ did not come at the first advent to condemn the world. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come to bring condemnation and judgment. Look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, Jesus Christ didn't come into the world to condemn the world. We were already sinners. We were already condemned. We were already born in sin, bound for hell, already condemned. Christ did not come into this world to say, I came because you're a sinner. You've got no hope. You're condemned. You're going to hell. Christ came into this world, said the Father loves his people and his creation. He loves it. He loves it so much, and you have a disease that is going to condemn you to eternal death and torment and the horrors of hell fire. Jesus Christ proved that truth. He said, but I have come that what? You might have life. You see, he came with a message of life and light and love and salvation and hope for all. You say, oh, yeah, but what about? No, there's no what about for 
all. Go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Have no doubts in your mind, friend, about why Jesus Christ came in the first time. Don't confuse his second coming with his first coming. Luke chapter 19, verse number 10. I'm sure you probably know this off, uh, off the top of your head. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Who's lost? All. All have sinned. None righteous. No, not one. You see, the person of Christ and the position of Christ only belie the purpose of Christ, and he came to save sinners, not to judge them at his first coming, not to condemn them at his first coming, but to save sinners. That is still the purpose. That is all sin under the blood of Christ. All sinners can be forgiven. All sin can be forgiven. All sinners can be forgiven. That is the purpose of Christ Jesus coming into the world to save sinners. But Paul also says this, of whom I am chief. That's the perception of Paul. That's the perception of a man truly saved or a woman truly saved. Paul said, of all sinners of whom I am chief. Now, let me say this historically. I don't think that's an over-exaggeration, actually, by the Apostle Paul when we were in about 64 AD. Paul probably actually literally meant, I have never come across anybody. Uh, chief means the, 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 the foremost of sinners, the first, the worst. Paul saying, I am, in 64 AD, been saved a long time, and he says, I am, present tense, the chief of sinners. I'm the worst. Do you know why? Because he knew he conspired to commit murder. He had breathed uh, threatening and havoc upon the churches. He pursued the people of Christ. He'd imprisoned families, beaten and smitten and afflicted them. And in his mind, as an absolute truth, he had not come across anyone who was a worse sinner than him. So I believe it applies actually positionally, and he meant it positionally, not just generally and humbly. But I will say this, dear friend. If you're saved, you're a child of God, you're a blood-bought, born-again Christian, therefore you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, you have the Holy Son of God, Christ in you, you have the Holy Bible where God unveils his holy nature and character, and he unveils our sinfulness and wickedness. If you're not a Christian who can say with Paul, I am the chief of sinners today. I recognize my sin more now than before I was saved. I had a conviction of sin when I got saved. Now the more I've read God's word, I see things that I didn't even think were sin are sin. And I know that but for the grace of God go I. I know that hell was my destination. I know that I was, am, and will be a sinner until the day I get my glorified body and I go to be with Christ and I see him and I shall be as he is. I echo with Paul. I am, present tense, the chief of sinners. Now, I can't say I've murdered somebody, and, and so it may not be positionally true. There may well be, and there are. I don't think that I'm as bad a sinner as Adolf Hitler. But I am a sinner, and I am the worst sinner I know. And there's the truth of it. When we see God for who he truly is, then we see ourselves as we truly are. And I can say, I am, present tense, the chief of sinners. That's the perception of Paul. It should be the present position of every truly saved Christian. And if it isn't, you're quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit of God, and you are not reading the Word of God, and you have a false perception of yourself. And it will help. So, well, isn't that going to bring you down? Uh, you know, and you've got a lot, of, a lot of things that go on today in churches. And people say, oh, I, you know, I, I'm a terrible sinner. They go, oh, no, you're not. Lift your self-esteem. Lift your, think positively. That's not biblical. The Bible's the most negative book on the face of the planet. Purposefully, because we're the most negative people that there are. God is positive. We are negative. And we get some of God's positive to add to our negative, but we never lose the negative terminal. That's reality. 
That's true perception. That, that, and what well, doesn't that bring you down? No, it lifts me up because I've got a great Savior who saved me despite my sinfulness, despite my wickedness, despite my uselessness. And he took me and he saved me and he forgave me and he cleansed me. And he said, now go out and tell the world about me. You have the highest position of authority that there is in time and eternity. Go and spread the message of hope and joy and glory and truth. And that lifts me. So knowing I am the chief of sinners, I am rejoicing in the Lord. I don't need no positive thinking. In fact, my thinking, I'm sure, possibly is like yours sometimes. It isn't the best thinking in the world, even if I'm trying to think positively. Uh, the only time I'm truly thinking right, thinking positively, is when I positively know that I'm a sinner. And I'm saved by the grace of God. And that's the perception of Paul. He even wrote, just got Ephesians chapter 2. We were so reminded of this truth. It's a, it's a pivotal truth of salvation. It links to salvation, this recognition of who we were. Christ died for our sins, not for our positive thinking. Ephesians chapter 2, look what the Apostle Paul wrote in the inspiration of God. We'll just go uh, start at verse number 4 for the sake of time this morning. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. You see, he loved us before we loved him. Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us, made us alive, quickened us together with Christ by grace, you are saved. And there's more. <laughs> and I've raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not sure what all that looks like. I just know it's true, and I believe it to be true. I am at this moment saved on earth, but I am seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. He said, well, that's just a promise that you've got. Okay, well, it just says I'm already seated in heavenly places. I don't know. We can... Chew that one through another time. All I know is this. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? And the most incredible thing about it, it's got everything to do with God and nothing to do with me or you. And as raised us up together, made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, it's that true perception that we were nothing, we were less than nothing, we were dead in trespasses and sins, and we were terrible sinners, and we were children of rebellion and disobedience following the course of this world, but God in his richness, God in his grace, God in his mercy made a way that we could be saved. But it starts with that recognition that we keep for the entirety of our life, as Paul did. I am chief. I am. Let's never forget that we are still sinners. We are saved, yes. But sin still lieth at the door. We still battle daily with this flesh. We must put on the armor of God. We must have a right perception. We're perfect in standing, but not in state. That comes at the day of our redemption. Let me just say this in closing. Let's quickly just say something about verse 16. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now, a lot of people actually misinterpret this verse and think the pattern is the Lord Jesus Christ and the pattern was his long suffering towards sinners. Now, that is a biblical truth. God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but also come to repentance. But that's not the subject of the verse. The verse says that Paul is the pattern of long suffering. He is the pattern for us to follow. First Corinthians 11 1 tells us that. That we can see from his writings that through the grace and mercy of God, that when we get saved, we will go through some trials, troubles, and testings if we live for the Lord. And we live that truth that Paul, in that truth that Paul knew that the Lord's grace was sufficient under the day. 
So we see the exclamation, the expectation, the exoneration, and lastly, the illustration, the example. Paul as a man, not God the Son, is our illustration, is our example. He is the example to the Gentile believers. We follow him as he follows Christ, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. The Lord himself is an example to us in whose steps we should follow, right? Peter writes that to us in 1 Peter 2.21. But we can't follow everything that the Lord Jesus Christ did because he was God. And God says, here was a man, the apostle to the Gentiles, whose office I've magnified. He is the subject of verse 16. You can read of his life and his long suffering to the point where he despaired even of life. Shipwrecked, beaten, imprisoned, under threat of murder. That's the pattern that we can follow. He is the subject. He is the illustration. Paul's sufferings are given as example because then we as Christians will happily follow that example because like Paul, we rejoice in the fact that our sins have been forgiven, that heaven is our true home. We are citizens of heaven, not citizens of this world. Your passport might get you from this country to another country, but it's the blood of Christ that gets us from earth to heaven, from hell to heaven. We are citizens of heaven. One verse, just as we finish, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. Uh, verse number 3, 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse number 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, and this is all right, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you be also of the consolation. Here we get expanded the model of the pattern that we've just read in First Timothy. Paul says these things have happened to us so that you, believers, as you go forward, you can be consoled. You can see the pattern. You can see the example. You can see the illustration. And like us, you can rejoice in those sufferings for the Lord. So, friends, as we conclude our message today, let's not forget Christ Jesus came into the world for one thing alone. Everything else is a bonus or a benefit to save sinners like you and like me. And the expectation from God is that message will be and is worthy of acceptation. Let us go out as the ambassadors of the king of eternity, knowing that we are giving more than gold and silver. We have a faithful saying, a faithful truth, and it is worthy of the most worth to be accepted. Uh, just if I could ask for everyone, bow your heads and close your eyes, please, this morning, just for a moment as we let that, that truth sit and sink that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let me just ask first and foremost again, with every head bowed and every eye closed, please. If you know that you were a sinner and you know that you've received the Savior, you've believed on Christ, your sins are forgiven. And you're bound for heaven and you know that to be true and you're certain of your salvation this morning. Would you just slip up your hand just in an affirmation before God of that certainty of your salvation that you know you're saved? Amen. Thank you. May the Lord help us to, to know we have the greatest message this world 
the greatest truth can ever be seen. Now, maybe I could call on those of you that perhaps didn't raise your hand uh, this morning. You do know you're a sinner. The Lord has convicted you of it. You've heard it this morning, but you know it to be true. But you know you're still in your sins. You know that if you were to die today, you would die in your sins. Your sins are stuck to you. They are yours. They have not been given to Christ. That your home would be hell, not heaven. That you're destined for eternal damnation. And you've learned and you know and you've been convicted of, maybe not even for the first time this morning, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who you are chief. And you need to be saved by just exercising that belief that Christ died for you and was buried and he rose again. And that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. And you know that to be true, and I say to you today, right now, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe he died for you. He took the holy wrath of a righteous God for your sins. He died in your place. And he rose again. He conquered death and hell. And that today you would receive Christ as your Savior. Right now you would pray and say, Lord, forgive me a sinner. I confess my sinful state, and I would receive and believe Jesus Christ as my Savior and be saved today. Perhaps if that's you this morning, would you just slip up your hand so we could pray for you that you would be saved today or you'd want to know how to be saved today if something doesn't make sense? Maybe you're just fighting God, resisting, rebelling, and today you would believe that Christ Jesus came into this world to save you. So. And if that is you this morning, and if you know you're not saved, and if you're not comfortable to slip up your hand, that's okay because it's a matter between you and God. And the hand doesn't make you saved, the belief does. And if you would, in the privacy of your chair, believe in Christ and his work on that cross and all he did for you and receive him as your saviour, then today... Dear friend, on the word of God, I can say that's all it takes for you to be saved from your sins. And you would have that assurance today. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, this world sometimes can buffet us to the point where maybe we don't realize the value of the message that we have and the primacy and the simplicity of why Jesus Christ came from heaven and humbled himself and condescended and came down. And because of our sins, he became a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And it's by his stripes, by his sacrifice, on that cross of Calvary, we were healed and made whole. And I pray this morning, Lord, as Christians, we take an uncomplicated but powerful truth, a faithful saying to this world, no more and no less, but the truth. My Lord, my God, I pray this morning, if there be any among us this day that have not yet trusted and believed in Christ, a Savior, cleanser, forgiver for all eternity, that this very moment, Lord, they are not hearing me, they're receiving Christ. They're believing in receiving Christ in this very moment, this very day, are being saved, cleansed and forgiven, washed whiter than snow for all eternity. But our Lord, give us that holy boldness, that holy confidence that we need, that we are your people with your message and your expectation is that every sinner will believe and receive it. Help us to deliver that which is worth more than gold and silver and rubies and diamonds, that which is of inestimable value, the glorious gospel of the Saviour of the world, Jesus Christ the Lord. In his name we pray. Amen.